sorry, I'm just going to say thanks everyone again for sticking with us. Um, and thanks, Jill, for being flexible about um, going going in this slot instead. Um, everyone who has stayed will be glad that they did um, because Jill Tidman is a, a wonderful filmmaker and activist, um, the executive director of the Redford Center, um, which supports filmmakers um, and entertainers who create all kinds of stories in all kinds of ways, um, but especially with themes of empowering action and empathy for the environment. Um, so they're really lifting people up um, and especially people who really need it. Um, young uh, storytellers, people of color, um, others that would not have their voices heard without the help. So um, thanks Jill for your work and thanks for again for your flexibility. Yes, thank you, Annie and Tiffany and Ivy and Lee and Philip for having me. Um, I'm so inspired by everything that I've heard and seen already today. There should be a film on everyone. I know there is a film on Sylvia already, Mission Blue, if you haven't seen it, um, I encourage you to watch. Uh, but I'm excited to, to talk to you a little bit today about, um, yeah, the work of the Redford Center and all the different reasons uh, we have to be hopeful about the future. Um, I am just, want to say I'm zooming in from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rometush alone people in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I have been in this work for many, many years now, uh, working with the Redford family since 2005. And I'm excited to show you a little bit about what we're doing. So I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully I can get this right. So yeah, I, I was making my notes for the presentation, I kept writing Hope Day. So now for me, Earth Day is also Hope Day. And um, one of the one of the main uh, whoops one of the main things that gives me hope is 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 really the leadership um, that I see in the stories that come through the organization. And um, this is Bob and Jamie Redford. I I know a lot of people know uh, Robert Redford as an an act, uh, artist. Um, actor, director, um, supporter of independent film. He's a businessman. Uh, and he's also a really deeply committed environmentalist and has been since the 70s. And his son, Jamie, um, was a celebrated documentary filmmaker. And the two of them started the Redford Center back in 2005, really as a way for the family to be able to consistently participate in helping put solutions forward for folks and bringing people together that may not otherwise um, be in the same room or understand their common interests um, to celebrate the voices of community activists and folks who are really from the most impacted um, parts of the world and make sure that their stories are heard and told and that their leadership is made visible. Um, so we say the environment is our mission and film is our medium. Um, we are one of the only US-based uh, nonprofits solely dedicated to environmental impact filmmaking. And historically we have um, worked mostly in the documentary space. Uh, one thing to know is that this is a really under-resourced area of work and um, congrats to Melissa and Trevor for getting their film made. Uh, Tiffany, Annie, and Ivy also know just how much it takes to produce a project like this. And we always say that the, the film is part one, the impact campaign uh, is part two. It takes years to do this work and it takes a lot of resources. Some of these projects have really big budgets and there's just, um, the, I would say filmmaking, has, filmmaking in this vein has not yet been seen as part of the solution set that we have at our disposal in the way that, um, that it could. And so that's one of the big tenets of the work of the Redford Center is to really position these projects as tools for educating, communicating, and activating folks. Um, and I'll take you through a bunch of uh, examples and places where hopefully you'll start to feel a little bit more hopeful. Um, over the years, though, we have been able to disperse $12 million to over 150 of these solutions forward filmmaking projects. Um, there's a wonderful collection that is on our website that you can see. There's also a catalog of our supported filmmakers, the folks who are really committed to, to telling stories in this space. Um, and so uh, with that, I, I think, you know, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll share our...
things happen because this community has power. All of these things, you could tie and connect to climate change. There really needs to be a cultural shift. We have a lot to learn from our Native American friends. Shifting the power back into the hands of people who have been marginalized. This is how we celebrate life. Like to show that film, it does sort of a better job than I usually can of talking about the way that we we think about the environmental um, challenges and opportunities, and it's a really intersectional, um, cross-cutting view. I know that we're at a point where I would argue nobody has not been touched by um, the environmental or climate crisis at this point, and and feels the the weight of the challenge. But I'm not sure everybody quite sees themselves as part of the solution yet, um, having some some role to play. And so a lot of what our work is about is trying to showcase storytelling that gives people um, you know, many different on ramps into the problem. So we did a series. This is from our clean transportation series um, that we put out last year. And really the 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 point of putting this up is to say that yes, clean transportation is about um you know, how, how we move around in mobility, but it's also about safety. It's about accessibility. Um, it's about happiness. We have a film called Transportation and Happiness. It's about planning. It touches so many different um, areas. That it's, that it's really not just about transportation. It's about many things that, that we all are impacted by on a day-to-day -day basis. This, um, you know, this is sort of the image that I always think of when I think about the climate crisis, because yes, it's about decarbonization, um, but it's also about justice. It's about health. It's about innovation. It's about regeneration. And we know that if we're not fierce in our protection um, and our protesting, that the path to decarbonization runs through indigenous land. And if we're not careful, the deep sea. Um, so this is this is a film still from a Standing Rock project called it Kichita. Um, there's many other projects in our collection that are featuring um, what I call Earth Guardians, the water, uh, land, and air protectors that are um, whose livelihoods and lives and culture are deeply threatened today. Um, and then, and then this is this is a still from a film called uh, Let Them Be Naked. And this one I picked. I'm going to show you the teaser for this. Um, it is about the fashion industry, and it's a really a deep reminder that consumption, yes, it's about culture, um, and it's about behavior change, but it's also about design and imagination and materials and water and energy production and distribution, recycling, reuse, and, you know, ultimately, we know the solution lies in a concept called the circular economy, where we're not just considering what we make, but we're also considering what we take uh, and what we waste. Clothing is such an intimate part of our lives. There was a reason why no one was talking about it. What we need to talk about is oil dependencies, synthetic fibers. 70% made of petroleum-based product. Up to 6,000 synthetic chemicals in textile apparel production today. And a lot of that is really highly unregulated. It comes into contact with our most sensitive and kind of vulnerable organ, our skin. I want to buy that t-shirt. I assume it's not going to harm me. They thought we were hippies and bad designers. It's going to take a village to change it, but we also need radical disruption. Can everything be changed in my lifetime? No, but I'm going to swing for the fences. Jeff is really looking carefully at not only the materials that he's using, but the dyes that he's using. Year upon year upon year, he's clearly shown sustainable solutions that still have that wow, beautiful factor. The consumer wants to make a difference. I want to flip the switch back on in people's hearts and that connectedness. We do have solutions and we can act. It could be that one conversation that helps people see that this is something they should be part of. Okay, so um, yeah, so well, thank you, Tiffany, for ex 
sort of giving me a new word, the activated hope. I know Tiffany and Annie, you were talking about this. This is exactly how we hold that word as well in the, in the idea. Um, it's not hope just for hope's sake, um, but we know hope, that hopelessness really does breed inaction and, and paralysis. And in the environmental movement, we have done you know, a great job, I would say, over the years of ringing the alarm bell and really talking about the consequences and sharing some of the science and the impacts ahead, um, even though we can predict some of it, but some of it we really don't know. Um, but what we've really not done well is helped engender hope for folks and really given them a reason to uh, feel encouraged about the future and invited folks to find their way in to be part of the solution. And we are, you know, at this point needing an all of the above solution. So I would like to say that there's really no act too, too small um, or big that that is required for all of us. You know, this is um, all of our all of our issue to solve together. And what's so fantastic about being with this community today is that I know this is where um, imagination and world building happens. And um, that's what we need more than ever. So I always like to, to share this quote from our co-founder, James Redford, who uh, was a double liver transplant survivor and really understood the potential that, that we have in society to make these changes and, and really the potential of human ingenuity and resilience um, to fix to fix things. And so that's that's how how we hold it when we talk about um, filling the hope gap as Dr. Anthony Lesowitz um, has really studied and presented that this, you know, most people today, you know, really want to to participate. They just don't know how um, and and aren't sure that anything that they do is is going to matter given the scale of the problem, but it all matters. And I think that's probably the most important thing that I, I want to um, put forward today is that it really, it really does all matter. And, and we have so much more agency than I, than I think most people feel that we do, you know, every, every decision we make is a vote uh, for something. So um, when we look for projects to produce and support, you know, uh, we look for projects that have that, what we call sort of solutions forward lens um, a, that doesn't gloss over the challenges, but also doesn't leave people without some sort of pathway forward or um, showcase of leadership and, and way, way for them to see themselves in the issue and way to see the issue as relevant um, to their lives. Uh, we also really focused on making sure that we're expanding representation in, in the storytelling that's out there. And historically, documentaries have been a great place to look for these for these types of of narratives, uh, more and more though we're we're starting to see the entertainment industry understanding that audiences want these stories and that they are more commercially viable today uh, than ever. And we're seeing some of the big players step in and start to invite the screenwriters um, and directors to to pitch these types of projects. So it is encouraging. We have a long way to go, but we know that you know if we're not if we're not seeing what's happening in the environment, um, in the content that we're watching, then we're not really watching uh, reality. It's not, it's not the reality that we're living in. And it's really hard to start the conversation. So bringing these stories into cultural spaces allows us to, to start the conversation. And we know that we can't solve problems if we're not talking about them. So that's one of the big reasons that we're also starting to move into the narrative fiction space, um, as well as shorts and um, looking into the social media sphere as well and, and doing some storytelling there and inviting storytelling there. Um, when we talk about you know, the, the environmental impact projects, it's, it does go beyond the commercial success of a project or the vi virality of a project. Um, we look for, for stories that we know are gonna connect movements that are gonna ignite discourse that have the potential to impact policy change um, to drive innovation and provide examples for copycat uh, activities to be taken up, to amplify the frontline voices, to empower communities to stand up for themselves and see how others are doing it and having success. 
Um, there's a big potential for education here, which we always say is the first step to action. How can you take action if you don't even know? Um, and then, of course, looking for projects that, in, that engender hope. Um, this is a project called We Still Hear, Nos Tienemos. It is. It was made by uh, Eli and Jacob um, Fantauzi. The they are Puerto Rican, and they went back home after Hurricane Maria devastated their community and started filming the community really rebuilding itself without any assistance from the U.S. government. And it's a beautiful, beautiful film that sadly was. Um, activated when Hurricane Fiona hit um, more recently, and they took this film around um, around the island to support folks who were trying to understand what just recovery really looked like. Um, this is a still I had to put in from uh, from Deep Rising, the film that I know um, our Children's Earth Foundation is supporting, and Sylvia mentioned, and this is. This is a cautionary tale uh, about how we are about to take the extractive land-based mining practices into the deep ocean uh, without knowing what, what is at stake really and truly. And I know there's so many folks like Sylvia and Dr. Marshall that are working to help us understand what is at stake down there, um, but it's such a, a massive uh, risk, I think, and this film is really trying to get the word out uh, about what is at stake. And they've brought Jason Momoa, the actor, on to narrate the project. It just premiered at Sundance Film Festival and with Jason's support got a lot of attention. Um, so that's another really, really timely, really exciting project that's on the festival circuit right now. Um, this is, uh, this is a project called Nobody Loves Me. So these are filmmakers who had always wanted to make a film about um, spe spe endangered species that weren't necessarily cute. So this is the, the scrotum frog, um, also known as the Titicaca water frog. It is endemic to Lake Titicaca in the Andes Mountains. It is endangered. And their, their tagline for this film series is, you know, um, why should only the cute survive? So this is a way for us to really start thinking about how we prioritize um, as a culture some of the um, some of the species that we're protecting and and some that that we aren't protecting in the way that need protection. Um, this is a film still from happening. This is a, a film that the Redford Center produced. Uh, Jamie Redford is in this shot. He directed it, and it was the one and only film he ever was in. And he made this film because he really started to ask the question, you know, who, what is, what is our trajectory in terms of clean energy and the clean, clean energy industry? Um, you know, who's making it? Who's buying it? What's happening? How far along are we? Where, what do we still need to do? And he went around the country um, talking to folks. This is him talking to the U.S. Navy that most people don't know that have really um, been on the forefront of innovation and testing um, some of these new technologies. He talked to Republican mayors down in Texas, um, state legislators in Nevada, um, big companies like Apple, innovators, uh, lots of different folks. And really the goal was to try to help people understand that there are reasons to be encouraged about the future. There's so much more progress being made than people know who aren't in the industry. Um, it's more affordable and accessible than ever. And um, the film has done a, a really, a, a lot of important work um, throughout the world. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone knows uh, Dasher Keltner, but um, he is a professor of psychology at, um, at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and he studies the science of awe. He does these big global research projects with thousands of people and has recently come out with a book where he, he shares that the most um, common source of awe is actually other people. And yes, nature's in there and collective effervescence and some other really interesting things. I would encourage you to check out his work and his book, but I think this idea of, you know, we get um, we get courage from other people's courage. Uh, we're inspired to be kind and strong and 
uh, overcome our obstacles by watching other people. And so when we when we look for stories, we're really looking for projects that have strong personal narratives that carry the stories and that provide the resonance and connectivity um, that we know we need and that these film projects have uh, the potential to, to put to put out there. Um, and so, yeah, when we talk about solutions forward narratives, these are just some examples of what, what that means. So showcasing courageous leadership, um, watching collective action, seeing progress and innovation, getting new perspectives um, on issues that are really where we're stuck, um, showcasing unlikely partnerships, looking as people are disrupting harmful systems. We know there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and yeah, displaying the interconnectivity, challenging us to, to, to not just fix these problems, but to build a very different future for ourselves that doesn't feel like a sacrifice, but actually feels much more supportive and, um, and tapping into like the, the, the radical design and imagination that we know we need to, to find our way out of, out of this problem. Uh, this is a, an example of a film um, that Tiffany and Andy and Ivy are also supporting called Youth Be Gov. This is the story of 21 young people in this country who have all had very different lived experiences of climate impacts, um, losing their homes, their farmland, their indigenous culture, and they are suing the US government for their right to a stable climate. And this lawsuit has been ongo ongoing for many, many years. And the filmmaker, Christy Cooper, just had to make a decision that it was just as important to get the story out there um, uh, you know, before we knew the result of the case so that we could, we could raise the visibility of the, the legal option to support the young people um, to think a little bit bigger about what we have, what we have at our disposal um, to try to make really, you know, sweeping change. This film is out on Netflix right now. Um, this is a, a project called Finding Home. And what I love about this project is it's an animated documentary series, um, 12 six minute episodes, and each one features the recorded testimony of an environmental refugee that's been uprooted from their home and forced to relocate. And it, the whole series is really about, you know, the climate migration that is already happening and, and that we know that's ahead and really um, challenging us to think about home and what does home mean? And how do we how do we deal with that and a sense of place um, and culture and tradition when we know there's going to be so much movement ahead for all of us? Um, uh, this is this is Robert Cervenka. He was one of the subjects of the film Fighting Goliath, another Redford Center production. Um, this is a story of a, a lot of, of folks who don't usually come together. Um, who came together in Texas to fight 19 dirty coal plants they were trying to build um, back in 2007, 2008. And, and, and Robert, you know, off, often and in the film talks about how he just never thought he would end up at a rally with environmentalists, um, working with mayors and faith groups and business leaders, all pulling in the same direction um, to try to fight these plants. And they were successful. So it's a really wonderful story that um, I think has helped a lot of political leaders see that, you know, if you, if you, if you do the right thing in, in the way of the environment and climate, the public will be with you. Um, and this is a, a still from a film called Meet the Future on the, I don't know, my right in the blue shirt. Um, the man that everyone's looking at is Umo Valetti. He is the founder of Upside Foods. And Upside Foods is a company that has um, created one of the leading cell-based um, meat products. So Uma grew up in India and has deep memories of being a young person at someone's house for a birthday celebration and found his way that was happening in the front of the house and found his way into the back of the house where there was an animal slaughter happening. And he couldn't and still is struggles to reconcile how there could be a celebration in life of life in one um, and at the same time, you know, a celebrate or a death happening and the connections there. And so he he said he started dreaming about meat hanging on trees 
And then he developed, you know, he let, he was a cardiologist and left his practice to develop a way to grow just the animal part. Um, so we don't have to grow the whole animal. So it's a really fascinating story about um, animal agriculture, but so much more. And um, this film is also available. It's completed. Um, this is, is a quote that, that my dad has on one of his t-shirts um, that I always think about. Um, Robert Swan is an explorer who, who dedicated his life to the preservation of Antarctica. And, um, and he said this back in 1986 on one of his uh, unassisted treks to the, to the South Pole. So I'll leave you with this today to just really think, I invite you to think about kind of where you can have influence, uh, big or small, your family, your community, your school, your job. Um, there's so many ways, there's so many things we can do. Um, and then we always just say, you know, the world needs your story. We, we all have a connection to the planet, obviously, as, um, as human animals, and also as, as folks who are really deeply impacted by what's going on in the world. And, and, and many of us find a lot of peace and connection and restoration when we are out in nature and, and spending time outdoors. And so just, yeah, invite everybody to think about what your story is and, and to say that, you know, there's, um, there's so many ways that we do storytelling on this and it really is the language of our time. And so just encourage, encourage the conversation and thank you all for listening. There. But like David said earlier, I think we're all just one drop in a big bucket. And so I'm going to um, thank all the speakers, but also ask all the audience members that when we send you the YouTube links in a week from now, if you could all share this uh, conference with at least one other person, but maybe even a hundred other people or a thousand other people, we think that it's important to make sure that the message reaches many more drops. And so um, it's been an amazing afternoon, but uh, I'll let the other people round up uh, the day with their comments. I guess Lee has something to say. Yes, uh, I would say the words um, all capital letters A W E is what we all feel. I think the audience is floored. We this has certainly been the most amazing, uh, hopeful form since we started three years ago, which is bizarre. Because when we were going to think about Earth Day, you could sort of expect that it would be somber and you know all the problems piling up. And you have managed through all the speakers to give an incredible sense of hope and possibility and uh, joy and beauty and humanity. So it's been an, a roller coaster of emotions. Um, I, I discovered something which I didn't know, which is called uh, hope spots. I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> that word came up I could not um, avoid thinking that actually the hope spots are the g-spots of mother earth very, <laughs> very hard true. to find need to be <laughs> with a lot of care and then it becomes very beautiful so there is something erotic even in this whole day there's beauty there's erotism there's human humanism I'm so glad the animals came also uh, completely next to us in the forest and business and that it's all one world. It's been amazing. Thank you. Ivy, Annie and Tiffany, this has been so well curated. Thank uh, you. We are really, really grateful. Well, I'm, it's always humble to be among the people that work so hard on these issues, but I'm always humble between before you, Lee and Philip, and the work that you do that has so much influence over our civilization. So we are honored again to have been able to present for you. And we're so grateful that you've given us this platform so that you can see other parts of our life and world that we live in and that we'll continue to grow together and that we will become even better and better at what we do and more effective. So we love you so much. Thank you. Bye.